Contingency theory is another grand theory of organizations because it provides a way to think about how organizations are connected to their employees, management, structures, and of course their external environments. It's an organizational theory that claims that there is no one best way to organize, lead, or make decisions. Instead, the optimal course of action is contingent or dependent on the internal and external situation. This means that contingent leaders are flexible in choosing how to adapt their approach, their strategies to suit the situation at a particular period and for their employees. William Richard Scott describes contingency theory in this way. The best way to organize depends on the nature of the environment to which the organization must relate. So his central conclusion and the central conclusion of contingency theory is that different situations call for different approaches. Management and the organization then they think of as an open system and that embraces all the anomalies and challenges that come up across the organization's path. So you'll hear in management speak a lot of times the notion of agility, adaptability, and that's really what contingency theory is about. So other situational or contingency factors may change. For example, customer demand for goods and services. There can be changes in government or policy and environmental policy and so on. All these require good leaders and good organizations to adapt quite quickly and quite readily. So the first major strength of contingency theory is that it has the support of a whole lot of empirical research. And it's critical because this means that the, the theory itself is reliable based on a lot of different trials and practical applied research. It's also beneficial because it's really widened our notion of leadership by persuading individuals, especially at the management class, to consider the various impacts of the situation on the decisions that they make. Another strength of contingency theory is that it is predictive. So it lets us have an understanding as to the types of leaders that will be most effective in very specific situations. So the theory is also helpful because it suggests that leaders don't have to be effective in all situations and that there are scenarios in which one leader may not be the perfect fit and so someone else may be better to step in. The last major advantage of contingency theory is that it, is that it really provides concrete data on different leadership styles. So it's applicable to organizations developing their own leadership profiles. So if one size doesn't fit all, you want to make sure that you have different types of leaders within the same organization so that you can slot them in. Now, from a communication perspective, I think contingency theory makes a lot of sense. In our field, we look for the factors that influence how people understand, accept, or reject information, and then we build strategy around it. At the heart of it, this is what contingency theory is trying to do. So this means that it allows for considering internal variables like an organization's characteristics, its communications department, its top management, internal threats, team attitudes, team experience as well, as re well as the relational attitudes. All of those may be relevant in a particular situation or not. Likewise, it also considers external variables like environmental threats, the industry, culture, stakeholders, and big political issues, for example. So it argues in the end that the best decisions come from successfully identifying those factors or variables that are gonna influence a situation and then developing a management or a communication strategy that best matches those. The key takeaways about contingency theory are, first, there is no single best way to organize. When we hear about the latest and greatest approach to management, we should acknowledge that that idea is probably viable in some situations, but not in all. The best question to ask is, what's going to work in this organization and in this context with these people? And second, this means then that contingency theory has a situational focus. This may make it sound deceptively simple, and from really from a conceptual standpoint, it is. 
However, what makes it challenging is that managers and employees have to be ready to adapt to different situations, different communication, and different structural needs to meet their goals. And that's where the difficulty often comes in. Like systems theory, there are a lot of examples of contingency theories. One good example is House's path goal theory. With this variation of contingency theory, House argued that there are three factors that will help an organization achieve its goals. Now, ultimately, it's important to note that the goals don't change, only the way to achieve those goals change. And the first of these factors, and this is the one that we'll focus most of the discussion on, is the leadership style. In House's research, he found that there are four different types of leadership style. I want to go through each one of those because it gives a flavor of how important it is to adapt and also why it may be that not a single person can execute all of these different styles. So the first style is the directive style. Under directive leadership, managers must guide employees' work goals and the established path that they can use to achieve those goals. For example, directive leaders may provide guidance and coaching, clarify an employee's roles and responsibilities, remove any obstacles that prevent the completion of their tasks, and give rewards when appropriate. So in some ways, direct leadership can be an awkward fit for, for situations that aren't, say, military or highly bureaucratic or hierarchical. But there can be situations where you need a strong and a forceful leader. So directive leadership has a good few benefits, including first, structure. Experienced leaders then provide structure in situations that lack direction. A second benefit is security and safety. So when you think of directive leadership, you should think about rules and regulations. So when you have those rules and regulations that drive directive leadership, for the employees and for even their external stakeholders, Issues of security and safety become a top priority. It's used to reduce uncertainty. Third is the clarity within roles. What directive leadership allows is that people know exactly what they need to do and how to do it in order to work more effectively. Fourth is simplifying learning. With directive leadership, there's really no room for guessing. And so when directive leaders tell people that they need to do something, that's really what they mean. Stick to the objective, head towards the, the end of the tunnel. And finally is accountability, which means that directive leaders focus on accountability. And so having someone constantly checking in with progress can help to hold everyone accountable and keep focused on the goal achievement. Now, that's the first style of leadership. The second style of leadership is supportive leadership. And you'll find that this is quite different in that supportive leadership is a style where the manager doesn't simply delegate tasks and receive results, but instead supports an employee until the task's completion. So a major upside to supportive leadership is the manager works with the employee until he or she is empowered and skilled enough to handle the tasks with minimal supervision in the future. So some of the principles of supportive leadership include employee dialogue. So there's always a two-way flow of communication, both giving and seeking feedback. Second, teamwork is absolutely encouraged because it's about lifting and helping to move towards the goal achievement, but ensuring that everyone is successful. Third, it also involves showing significant levels of commitment, both from the employee side as well as from the leader side. To do good supportive leadership means that you have to take extra time and give people the attention and the resources that they need. So fourth, it allows leaders to focus on relationships, both within the team and also between themselves and their team members. But most importantly, it also means that the leader can't sit above the tasks, that they are much more likely to get their hands dirty. They're going to be participating along with the employees to work towards the goal together. So if we think of the divergences or the differences between directive and supportive leadership, we also get a sense in the third type of leadership, participative leadership, that there's a different kind of style that comes into play 
very strongly with this. So participative leaders, it's also known as de democratic leadership, is where the employer invites the employee to take part in the organizational decision making. So this isn't often common in the corporate world, but there are certainly professions that require this type of attitude, like social workers, arbitrators, therapy, facilitation. But that doesn't mean that it isn't actually potentially very valuable in a corporate setting. Because there are six parts to participative leadership. The first is facilitating the conversation. Instead of decreeing and, and just giving ideas expecting them to be done, or even asking you know, what someone needs in order to support, it's about having a conversation about the best ways to achieve the goals. So second, there is an open sharing of information and knowledge that there should be a level of transparency in the decision-making process to make it clear from both directions what's happening. Third, people are encouraged to share their ideas. And, and what's important about that and facilitates the sharing of ideas is that the leader communicates a genuine interest in adapting their approach based on those suggestions. So in the fourth part of participative leadership, what has to happen is a synthesis of all the information available. You take the ideas, you take the available evidence, and then you figure out as the leader the best course. And that's the fifth step, is taking the best possible decision. Now, does this mean that necessarily you're going to take the suggestions of the employees? No. The objective isn't to have the, the leader's ability and guidance diminished, but to ensure that they are taking the information, the full information, based on a full investigation of all of the perspectives, ideas, what have you, and then ultimately making the best decision and communicating that decision back to the group. Because what is recognized with participative leadership is that the implementation process, the buy-in, is just as important as the decision making the feeding up and the feeding back. So this obviously would take a little bit of extra time. And so you start to see a sense of what might be expeditious and what might actually take quite a bit of time extra in order to implement these decision-making styles and these leadership styles. But then in the fourth style, the achievement-oriented style of leadership, it has quite a different focus, and you'll see probably who's best suited to this, because if we think of achievement-oriented leadership, it's about challenging goals being set, that high performance is expected, and that management has a really high level of confidence in the employee's ability to achieve the goals. So in this case, in a lot of organizations, there's a spirit of competition as a key metaphor. So leaders are meant to pick the right strategies to support their employees, but the work is challenging. One way to think about this is that leaders must be willing to let followers know they won't stand for low levels of achievement. So assertive, achievement-oriented leaders model their own appropriate behavior, vigorously oppose anything that takes away from, from the effectiveness of their team, and involves followers in collaborative planning and decision-making. So the leader themselves is well informed in their respective area of responsibility, but also seeks continuous growth, both personally and professionally, and expects this from his or her employees. So everyone within the group is consciously and aggressively encouraged to facilitate the development of values and acceptable behaviors within their areas of influence. And these values and behaviors support the achievement of the system goal and its outcomes. So there are three basic behaviors in achievement-oriented leadership, and it includes first, a task orientation, so that there's a clear explanation of the roles, the information, delegating responsibilities, problem solving, and innovation and creativity management. Second is a focus on people, and it includes personal development, team building, management, and internal consulting. And third, there isn't a ton of of leadership control. It's an average level of leadership control. And the internal organizational orientation is really on the team to get on with the work at hand. But how do leaders and managers know which approach to pick? 
And this is where the contingency factors that come into play. They have to assess both their followers' characteristics as well as the situational characteristics. So if we think about follower characteristics, there are three principal factors that will come involved. First is the amount of experience and knowledge. So for example, where the first two styles, the directive and the supportive, might be best suited for people with low levels of experience and knowledge, the final type, the achievement oriented, would really only be suited for those with the, where the employees had high levels of experience and knowledge. And then the participative, probably somewhere a little bit in between. So as an example of how you need to identify the best style is absolutely going to be contingent upon the amount of experience and knowledge. Similarly, what are the employee or the follower needs and what is their personality? So on the personality side, if you have people not only who have experience, but have strong opinions and you want to respect those opinions, a directive style of leadership would be a terrible choice. Um, so as someone who in their own field is an expert, I would absolutely hate to work for someone who proceeded to tell me what was important for me to, to look at in my field. And that would be counterproductive to, to getting the best out of me. And that's going to be the case for a lot of folks. So personality, there are also people who don't like a lot of time spent on relation, relational interaction, that kind of stuff. Those are the types of follower characteristics that all makes a very delicate balance. Given that the objective is always goal achievement, the follower characteristics are really important to picking the right style of leadership. Likewise, the situa situational characteristics are also important. So the level of the task structure, the authority within the system, and the nature of the group are, for path goal theory, the three critical situational characteristics. So how complex is that task that is being developed? Is it something that is highly complex that you need a lot of expertise? Or is it pretty simple that you just need the job done? That can affect this style of leadership. Likewise, are you in an organizational setting where there is a lot of conferred authority? Is it very hierarchical, in other words? If you're in a very hierarchical organization, it's very difficult to have participative leadership. And so that may not be particularly effective. Likewise, if you're in a very flat organization, one that doesn't have a lot of different layers of management, directive styles of leadership may not work. And then finally, the nature of the group. How long has the group been working together? Do they work together regularly? How experienced is the group? All of those kinds of group components whether there's even conflict existing within the group can tell you what type of and what style of leadership might be appropriate. So it's about a picks and pick and mix. You're trying to figure out what is going to get us to the goal achievement. So, and the goal achievement is not only about the material goals of the organization, but also about follower satisfaction, productivity, and then ultimately the reward, or was the organization profitable? Uh, did it meet its annual objectives? Those kinds of things. But House's path goal theory does emphasize both productivity and follower satisfaction as critical components. So this is just one example of contingency theory, but it should give you a sense of what most contingency theories are focused on. They may focus on um, employee development, or they may focus on leadership, or they may focus on goal achievement. House's path goal really focuses on leadership, but it's all about the mix and match and trying to figure out if you're going to be the optimal leader in this case, what factors do you have to consider?